Three. Hey, Kevin. Hey. Welcome. Thank you. Looks like it works. That's great. Great. Awesome. Let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome okay. to another hour cryptocurrency talk. I am MA5, your host. Today, we have the pleasure of having with us Kevin O'Leary, aka Mr. Wonderful of Shark Tank fame. Welcome, Kevin. How great to be here. Today? Thank you very much. Kevin will be happy to discuss with us his views on crypto, his portfolio, and where he sees the market heading in the next few months. That's great. Awesome. So first, I'd love to just go back to time, actually, and hear the story of how you went from having a bearish view on crypto to now. Like back in 2019, you said Bitcoin is garbage and worthless. <laughs> today. Yes, you I've never been able to live that down. I, I was with, with Pomp on CNBC and I called it garbage. And so let me explain my position at that time. I actually bought my first ETH in, in Bitcoin in 2017. Um, however, as all of you remember, at the time, the regulator was extremely... Um, well, I'm not even, I can't even get a good word for it. They were not on board with cryptocurrencies or tokens or monetization in any way through digital uh, vehicles. Particularly at the time, there was a token being contemplated to take a hotel in New York public through tokenization. Um, now, I'm involved in many companies that are, are, in, are in financial services. I'm an investor in them. Um, I use their services and they're all compliant with the regulator. And so my own compliance departments put extreme pressure on me to back off crypto because they were very concerned that we'd end up being a lightning rod. And I had to take a much more muted position. All of that changed in the last 36 months as regulators in Switzerland, Germany, England, France, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and even here stateside have started to realize cryptocurrency is not going away and that somehow it's got to be put into the lexicon of financial assets or payment systems or whatever you want to consider it. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, I've become very active in the space. I recently became a shareholder in FTX. I'm a, I'm a paid spokesperson for them. I hold most of the majority of my assets on the FTX platform. Um, and I've, I've grown the portfolio um, remarkably, it, 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 at the beginning of the year, I was a 3% weighting. The target was to get to 7% by year end of the operating company's assets. However, and I haven't disclosed this to anybody, you're the first to hear it, uh, because of the appreciation of so many of the assets I have now, the rapid appreciation, we're almost at 10% today. So I'm going to end up at the end of the year with a very significant holding across the board in crypto assets and not just Bitcoin. That's my whole point. It's not just Bitcoin. Crypto and level one, level two chains, decentralized wallets, these are all assets that should be considered in an investment portfolio. All right. Yeah, great. So let's talk about the state of the market as it is right now. Where are we in the market cycle? Bitcoin is at all-time high. Stocks are high too. The Fed is expected to taper soon. So that's also coming. So it's widely believed that assets like crypto may collect heavily. So where do you see this going? Are we at the top or are we going up further? It's a very, it's a very good question. Let's deal with inflation first. You mentioned it. It's, it's important. Right. Now, we just printed some of the largest inflation numbers we've had in decades. It's not yet reflected in the 10 year bond, which still remains under 1.5%. And the reason that is happening and the way to look at this, all of you market participants is the canary in the coal mine is always the 10 year treasury. The 10 year treasury seeks trouble with inflation. You're going to see rates go. You're going to see that interest rate go up materially. Some of you may remember what happened in the late 70s, early 80s, when interest rates on 10-year bonds were like 16, 15, 14 percent. We're no, we're not, we're no near that now, obviously. But the reason you're not seeing the bond move yet and why inflation is not yet in the market's crosshairs is that half of the inflation is coming from supply, supply chain disruption. And let me give you an example, real-world example. 
let's say I own a company that makes gym equipment, and I do, and we manufacture it domestically, but we got most of our parts originally from various suppliers in Asia and other locations because the metal was cheaper or the manufacturing of the components were cheaper. We can't do that anymore. We cannot source those because we can't get the product through the containers, through Los Angeles on containers to go to wherever we have to manufacture them in the U.S. So we source the materials domestically because we don't want to give up our supply chain. We don't want to give up orders. We don't want to give up our customer support and they want to buy barbells and gym equipment and benches and everything else. So we're still manufacturing, sourcing the materials here at a 30% increase in cost. We reflect that by raising our overall prices seven to 9% and we're not losing any business, but it's inflationary in the sense that what costs a thousand dollars only five months ago now costs 7% more. That's inflationary. However, as soon as the supply chain's corrected, the market will force us to reduce our prices because we have competition and we will source our materials the way we did before at 30% less cost. And so that's happening right through the economy, all 11 sectors of the economy. So half of it's coming from that. Now, the, the other half is real inflation, and that's coming from some misallocation. For example, by shutting down our hydrocarbon industry, and I am not against green energy, believe me, I, I graduated from environmental studies. I want to solve our problems, but we cannot run this economy on solar and wind alone. And so the price of gas has gone up because we've got policy in place that's shutting down the source of our hydrocarbons at a time when perhaps it's a little too early to do that, but we all want to. So you've got some real inflation and you've got some, some, some temporary inflation at, from the gym equipment example I gave you. That's why the market will continue to go higher. And the other reason it's going to go higher is another trillion dollars is coming in free money from a helicopter from the government in this package has just been passed on infrastructure. And I'm not against that package because it benefits all 11 sectors of our economy. I don't like the other package because it doesn't make sense to me at this point, but infrastructure makes sense. And it's probably going to give you even more animal spirits in Q1 and Q2 next year. Great. So according to you, we are going high. Let's see how that. Yes. Goes. Yes, we are going higher. That's what I'm saying. Awesome. So what does your crypto portfolio look like today? You mentioned FTX. Apart from Bitcoin, what other crypto companies or crypto even assets that you're interested in, invested in? Well, of course, I, ha I, haven't, I, ha I, haven't, I haven't disclosed yet my, my, um, my total holdings. I'm going to be doing that as soon as I can. I've got a couple more positions um, yet to, to be added, uh, making some more investments this month um, in some teams that are developing you know, some competing uh, chains. I mean, I, I, I'm really, I don't know who's going to win. I'm not, I'm not making the assumption. Some people think that if the game is over and Ethereum is it. I don't agree. I think for financial services, there are many other alternatives, whether it be that Solana or anything else, um, you know, Polygon, others that, that are looking at, like, I do not want to wait. Like some transactions that I make, I cannot wait for ETH. I cannot wait for Ethereum. It's too slow. Now, everybody's talking about, you know, the next turn in the road will be better, but right now it isn't. So that leaves a crack open for lots of other teams to develop other solutions that might be more interesting. And I think we have to consider that. Um, and if you're an investor like I am, you want diversification. You really do. You want to figure out how to be diversified. And I think that's the key here is some level of diversification across these different chains. And, and, that's, and I'm going to be reflecting that in how I invest. I agree. Yeah, definitely. Especially in crypto, diversification goes along. Well, let me give you an analogy that I'd like people to consider, because I think not enough of this dialogue that we're having happens. People are so critical of crypto investing. And, and, and yet, let's just leave alone for a minute the idea of Bitcoin. Let's just stop talking about one asset. Let's just talk about the entire crypto universe, as it were, you know, and think of it this way. When you invest today as a classic investor, let's say you're an institution and you put to work a billion dollars, probably 20% of that is held in stocks like Google 
or Microsoft or Oracle or many other companies, even Apple, for example, you're not scared to invest in those stocks because they are part of the digital economy. You're happy with what they've been doing in terms of creating value for their shareholders over time and their solutions. Now, if you believe that it's good to own Microsoft, what is Microsoft? Microsoft is a software company. All the solutions that they create value with and all the productivity that they give enhancement to is software. They have software engineers. Right. Well, everybody, guess what crypto is? It's software. It's the same thing. Now, either you believe that it will be enhancing productivity, will be enhancing payment systems, will be enhancing assets, you know, in terms of value or NFTs or whatever it is, but it's all software. So why in the world wouldn't you invest in crypto? Why wouldn't you? It's the same thesis. So if everybody could just forget about, you know, the pros and cons of Bitcoin or this coin or that token, or whatever, and invest in software, then your job becomes, can I identify the best teams? Who are the best developers? How do I invest in them? What ledger is that? Should I own a piece of that too? That is how I'm looking at it. And so I am a software investor and I am going to put an allocation into the software of crypto because I believe it will change and be disruptive to a lot of different markets all around the world. Agreed with that. So now coming to this market specifically, what is the biggest risk you see that crypto markets face today? I think this has been wide open and it's been very important to understand it. It's the regulator. Now, if tomorrow morning, let me give you a use case. And I think everybody will understand this. Let's say as I late earlier this year in our operating company, we diversified uh, our, our real estate assets. We, we sold off some commercial real estate because there's use changes going on. Obviously, office towers aren't as valuable as they were pre-pandemic. And so we reflected that in our portfolio. We took we went from 31 percent in commercial real estate down to eight. That generated a lot of cash. When I went to the cash desk and this is not my problem alone. Everybody's got this problem. They offered me 21 percent interest on an annualized 21 basis points, 20.21. 21 basis points. Inflation's over 2% right now. That means I'm going to be losing money by the month in terms of buying power with that cash. I said to the crypt, I said to the, the coin desk, wait a second, what other ideas do you have? And they said, why don't we stake some USDC? Why don't we lend USDC? We can make contracts, you know, for 30, 60, 90 days that yield up to six, seven percent, and even higher on the FTX platform, you can do even better. I went to my compliance department. I said, guys, we've got a huge problem here. What are we going to do with all this cash? And they said, never. We can never put it into USDC. The regulator has not approved it. And I went to our auditors and said, are you okay if I put this into USDC? Will you sign the audit statement? They said, never. We'll never do that. At the same time, I can't make any interest on cash. So I basically got them kicking and screaming to agree to an experiment. And we started to stake USDC. Now, here's the risk. If tomorrow morning I woke up and I, you know, and, and I heard from the regulator that stable coins are illegal, I would be in big trouble. And that's why I've had to be conservative in how much we put into stable coins. And USDC is my choice because I like the I like the circle platform for it. But the whole point is, I don't think that's going to happen. This is a personal opinion. I'm not telling people what to do. My own risk assessment is the innovation that's occurring in stable coins, the innovations that, that's occurring on platforms like FTX and Circle and all of these software developers creating these innovations is too valuable to the US economy. We need to lead this globally. We need to be the leaders. We need to show the standards. We need to develop the stable coins that represent US dollar all around the world. So the people that don't own the US dollar itself are willing to own a stable coin backed by the US dollar and maintain global dominance in terms of the reserve currency. All of this is software development. I don't think the regulator is blind to that. They understand it. They just need to apply the rules, tell us what they are, and as an industry, we will advance. We lead the charge. It has to be America that does that to set the standard for everybody. Now, if all of a sudden we regulate these teams out of business, that's a big mistake for all of us. Exactly. And regulated regulations have been moving in the right directions, especially in the last six months. 
that's something we can all be happy about. Well, I, I think it is good. I really do, because we've seen at least this first move. Now, there's 25 applications for Bitcoin ETFs with the regulator right now. 25. They did let a futures contract one get to market. As you know, in Canada, there's multiple ETFs now. The regulator there is more lenient and is allowed, and, and the demand is insatiable. So at some point, we are going to get the first Bitcoin ETF. And that will be a very important day because that means the underlying asset will be institutionally approved. And so you will start to see a lot of, 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 of managers allocate to Bitcoin one or two or three percent. And the thesis that I have about investing in Bitcoin and Ethereum and many other uh, you know, assets, crypto assets, is as they get widely adopted and the regulator approves them, there'll be price appreciation based on supply and demand issues. And so either you believe that or you don't. Great, great. So we've discussed the worst case scenario, which would be the regulator just, you know, putting a lid on all this. What's the best case scenario for crypto? Let's say in the coming 50 years, do you see Bitcoin replacing gold or even the dollar for that matter? Will banks go out of business? Where does all of this fit in, in the coming years? You know, uh, these are these are great uh, debates. There's no question that the payment systems as they are structured now are going to become under, they're going to get on, come under fire because they're inefficient, they're slow, and they're expensive. Let me give you a use case that I deal with every single day. So let's say I want to buy Nestle stock. Everybody knows Nestle chocolates. It's a Swiss company. It trades on Zurich. And I want to own the stock in, a, in, a, in my portfolio in the native currency, Swiss francs, on the Zurich exchange. I have to take USD, I have to take US dollars, I have to go to an FX trading desk, convert it into Swiss francs, then I have to buy the stock. In doing so, I am clipped multiple basis points, and there's no value added whatsoever no value added by the FX trader whatsoever. All it was was friction. Just cost me money for no value whatsoever. Then after I sell the Nestle stock, when I decide to rebalance it, there I am in Swiss francs and I want to return that back to dollars. I have to go through the FX desk again. Well, how about if we just decided that we were going to use a payment platform? Let's say USDC, that I could buy the stock in USDC, hold it in USDC, trade it in USDC, sell it in USDC, and be paid back in USDC. I never need that FX trader again, ever. Or if you don't like USDC, give me another stable coin. If the regulator in Switzerland and in the US agreed that XYZ stable coin on XYZ ledger worked, I'm going to use it. And it's going to cost me a whole lot less. Yeah, there'll be some gas. I get it. But it's not going to be as much as I'm paying right now for the crazy FX traders that I've spent millions of dollars on over the years. And they've added no value whatsoever. So I am one. My, my noise that I make about this when I talk about it is I can consistently say, let's get the regulator to regulate. Give us the rules and let's get going because there's so much money to be saved so much more efficiency to be brought to our economy, and we should lead the charge. We should set the standards here and let the globe determine which platforms they want to work with, but we should develop it all. This is a, this is a chance, you know, let me give you an example. We, we created the semiconductor here, right here in America. The only country 40 years ago that made semiconductors or whatever they were first, even the most tertiary transistors, we're made here, 100% of the market. Today, we only have 25% of the manufacturing of, of semis and chips in America. The rest are in Asia. And we've decided over the pandemic how bad an idea that was, because now we, we need chips we can't get. We're at that stage again. Crypto is at a place like when the first transistor was invented. It's time to take control of crypto and make it ours. We should totally develop it here. I'm not saying teams from other countries can't work, but we should set the standards. We should set the regulation. Everybody can enjoy it and work on it if, if the standards are met and set here. We shouldn't let the Chinese do that. We shouldn't let the Europeans do that. We should do that. And, and that 
is I, I feel very strongly about that. So we don't end up in a situation we're at now in many other technologies. So just talking about regulations, what specific kind of regulations would you like to see adopted in this space? So we've already seen quite quite a bit of stuff this year. In the last six months, we've seen the ETF, we've seen the infrastructure bill. What else could really take crypto to the next level from here? Here's what we're going to need. And I was actually talking to the FTX guys about this today. What we're missing to attract institutional capital are compliance platforms that plug and play into the existing compliance. So let's say I'm, I'm managing stocks and bonds right now, okay? When I buy a stock, when I buy some Tesla right now, my compliance officer immediately sees it on their dashboard, on their screen. I've increased my position for 2% to 5%, and maybe I've put leverage on it. Maybe I've put 50% margin on it. That whole system is integrated. It happens instantaneously. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to do a spreadsheet. I don't, I don't need a calculator. The whole system works. And so at 401, when the market closes, immediately they know exactly where my positions are, what I made, what I sold, what I lost, what I went on. It's all seamless, goes to the auditor, they sign the statements, goes to the regulator with the report. We don't have anything like that in crypto. So as an industry, we need to provide the tools to allow institutions to trade and own cryptocurrencies on a compliant basis. We need dashboards for them. We need tools. We need reporting. As soon as the regulator sees that we're doing that as an industry so that they can get the reporting they need and, they, and, that, and we, whatever rules they make, whatever they make, whatever rules they decide to make, we have to be able to report to those rules. That infrastructure doesn't exist yet. And, and that, again, is software. And everybody involved in crypto should understand if you really want to see price appreciation, you have to make it seamless for the institution to be able to do what they do today with crypto. They can buy any stock in the world they want, and it completely gets reported seamlessly through their systems. We don't have that in crypto yet. We're going to need that. That's number one. In terms of regulation, what I would like to see resolved you know, in the next 12 months would be the rules on stable coins. For me, as, as a, you know, for, for oper in an operating company, I really want to use USDC a lot more as a payment system, as a transfer of asset system. Um, and I need to have the regulator determine what the issuers of stable coins have to do. Do they have to be registered banks? Fine. Register them as banks. What is it? One to one dollar for one for one stable coin? Whatever it is, tell me what it is. Is it a money market regulated like a money market? Whatever it is, tell me what it is. Because the amount of money I would put into stable coins would be tenfold, 20, 30 fold what I have now if the regulator would regulate. Thank you. That really makes a lot of sense. We are currently in a regulatory void and definitely these kind of clarifications would advance our industry. Absolutely. You're right about that. That's, that, that's you know, th this is the opportunity is, is so huge to just solve this problem. And, and, and really, I, I'm, I'm convinced now, and I said this earlier, the regulator understands the potential of this technology and wants to be able to, to keep it domestic. I would never want to give this up to another country. It's too important. And we are at the, I'm not saying there are other developers shouldn't be involved in creating new innovations, but the regulatory environment should be set here. Once we set the, regula the regulatory stable, like whatever it's going to be, the world will adopt it. That's my, my thought. And when that happens, the floodgates will be open. There'll be a tremendous amount of capital coming into crypto. Great, exactly. Let's talk about investment patterns. So now you've definitely worked a lot in the institutional space. Do you see a trend picking up where, you know, family funds, pension funds, when retirement funds are investing in crypto and this thing becomes more mainstream? Every fund, every retirement fund allows a minimum percentage to crypto. Do you see that happening anytime in the near term? 100%. But let me tell you what they want right now. What they want to be able to do, 99% of them right now, would be of the traditional pension, state, sovereign funds, et cetera, would be to allocate 1% to 3% in Bitcoin. Bitcoin is being considered not a currency, not a payment system by most institutions. It's being considered an asset, somewhat akin to gold, with the advantage that it can be staked so that you can actually loan it and have some kind of reward or yield associated with it. My guess it would be a one to three percent. Now that what's holding them back 
is we talked about compliance. We've already talked about that. There is one issue. I raised this last year at Bitcoin 2021. Certain institutions led by decrees like the Larry Fink ESG letter are concerned that Bitcoin is not mined, not only ethically in China, but also not sustainably. And as an industry, we can solve that problem. And let me explain how. If we could, because you got to remember, it's not just the regulator that we need to check the box on. Let's assume the regulator allows Bitcoin, all right, and the, the rules are set and, and, the, the, and, and we know what they are. We're still not home yet. We're going to need to be able to tell an institution that has an ESG sustainability committee and is under a mandate like the Larry Fink letter from BlackRock, which says you can't, you know, own hydrocarbon stocks or whatever it is to put in place. They're worried that a lot of the Bitcoin that's previously mined or is being mined is being mined with with coal fired electrical generation, which is a problem. I get it, I get it. But here in the US, for example, there's lots of initiatives to mine sustainably. So you could get 14 acres, 20 acres in West Texas, get on the grid in both solar and wind and build you know, up to a gig there. And, and, and you'd be welcomed by the state regulator there and you have to give some back power, power back to the grid in Texas because we saw what happened in the last winter and all that. But the point is, as you were awarded those coins, you knew with certainty where they were mined, how they were mined, they were mined sustainably, and you simply keep them on the balance sheet of the company that did it. And then you as a shareholder own the stock. That would be very compliant with an institution, or you could own the coin knowing that it was mined sustainably. I think the demand for sustainable, and it's not it's no different than any other coin you own, except that your compliance department is not gonna give you any trouble over it because you've proven to them the provenance of the coin and the fact that it was mined sustainably. I think that's coming. I think there's billions of dollars being mulled over right now. I know I'm involved in a project I'm investing in to do exactly that so that I can own Bitcoin and not have anybody that I service in an institutional client base tell me that I didn't do it ethically and I didn't do it sustainably. Yeah, that's definitely a trend that's picking up now, especially after China has, you know, banned almost all mining there. So the U.S. industry is only poised to grow in the coming years. The mining industry. Again, we can take leadership in this. We can be. We can mine ethically. We can mine sustainably. We can do. We can. There's so much opportunity to take the lead. I mean, China has decided to try and convince me as an investor to buy their digital coin. Not a chance in hell I'll ever do that. Mm -hmm. That's never going to happen. And so they're never going to get their one to be the global currency. I don't think that's going to work for them. It. it they're trying to to cent take centralized control with a digital currency that they can monitor its use everywhere in the world. I, I just don't see it happening. So we should, we should be the country that provides a stable coin backed against the US dollar, which is the default currency of the world right now. Great, great. So come talk about specific currencies, specific types of currencies. Do you see a future for privacy coins? These are currencies that are that have not grown as much in the last one or two years, but people still use them. Do you see them growing in the current regulatory environment? I, I, I don't think it's as a big an initiative as some of the other opportunities. I mean, you know, you have to pick your, your focus. And, and when I talked about diversification in, in crypto, it means you have to start thinking about beyond one single token, one single coin, one single chain, one single you know, decentralized ledger or centralized ledger. It's, it's sort of, you have to take a, a, an approach and, and put weightings to it. You know, in a typical portfolio, if you were to say, here's a, here's a typical mandate that a sovereign fund would use. They would say, they'd have rules like this. You can't have more than 5% in any one stock, like a Tesla or a Microsoft, and you can't have any more than 20% in any one sector. And so, I, and, I, and that means there's 11 sectors in the S&P, so you can't own more than 20% tech stocks or real estate or whatever it is, consumables. So you, you have the same theory coming into the institutional mindset about where you want to invest. And right now, if you gave a choice to an institution, they would put a full 5% weighting in Bitcoin. They'd start there. Then they might put 3% in Ethereum. Then they might put two in Solana. Maybe they'd put some, I mean, the whole idea is they'd start to diversify. Maybe Polygon, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it depends what, you, you, have to, you have to place your bets and that's how it's gonna happen. And I think those are the areas that will get most of the attention. 
Uh, so, hey, oh, can I can I have a chance to speak for a second? Sure. Okay. Hey, uh, I just wanted to say, like, I'm a huge fan of uh, Kevin O'Leary. Like, I follow you on YouTube and everything. Okay. I'm a little nervous, but uh, <laughs> uh, I was wondering your opinion. Uh, you say you invest in other chains because you don't think Ethereum has what it takes uh, to scale. Um, what what do you think about layer two solutions uh, that are built on top of Ethereum that allow for yeah. look, look, Ethereum that, that, as that, like a settlement layer? I, I agree. I agree with you. If it can accelerate the settlement, if it can be more efficient, nothing wrong with that. But I also believe there's room for completely different chains, and and there's and you know let let me. I always like to use use cases. Okay. Um, let me give you an example. Let's say, uh, let's go to NFTs for a minute, just for a minute. And let's say, uh, and I'm, I'm a huge watch collector, okay? So I collect very rare watches as an asset class, as an investor. I have a very, very, very large watch collection. I would like, when I'm buying, you know, a, a, a vintage piece, let's say a one of a kind FP Journe or one of a kind um, uh, Patek Philippe or something like that. I wish it had an NFT because I don't have to hire someone to authenticate it if it's already been authenticated once and it has an NFT associated with it, with the serial number, with the sound of the repeater, with a, a picture of the dial, all of that stuff with a, you know the, the original paper, all of that stuff inside of one NFT and a contract. The trouble is if I'm pricing that and I'm doing it on Ethereum, I could wait. I, I, so I'm calling somebody in Hong Kong and I, I want to see that contract. I want to see that. And I might have to wait 30, 40, 50 seconds. And if I'm in an auction and I'm bidding on that piece, I can't wait 20 or 30 seconds. I need it now. Ethereum can't do it. It's too slow. It's too slow. Uh, I, I, would, I would like to disagree with you there. Um, I, I know Ethereum layer one is too slow, but layer two, um, there are some projects that allow for thousands of transactions per second. And uh, there's emerging projects that you should look into uh, that do such I bet you, things. I bet you I already own those projects. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll tell you something. I, I have a lot of Ethereum, okay? I am not against it. I just see that there are so many other use cases. You say a few thousand transactions a second. How about 100,000, 200,000, a million a second in the FX market? You can't do that on Ethereum right now. So you, you, I'm just saying, place your bets. I like Solana. I really like it. And I, I like Polygon. I really like it. I mean, I like what those guys, I love the teams. I meet the teams. I see so many, here's, here's what I think. I've been in the software industry my whole adult life, okay? I've been an investor in it forever. The hottest hands in the world over the hottest keyboards of any sector of the economy are in crypto, right? The smartest people I've ever met. They've all drifted out of other parts, even even space. You want hot developers, you're gonna find them on these new ideas in development on chains, on decentralized ledgers, all these different ideas. It is an incredible time to be involved in this. We are at the beginning of a remark. This is like being at the beginning of the internet the first time. I, it, it's Gen X right now. No, oh, it's, it's, it's so exciting. Out, out with the old money. I half my day new money. to crypto development teams. I have a question for you, Kevin. Yeah. So want to say giant fan, man. Um, I right now am with a veteran nonprofit. What would be your advice to us? We just launched our NFTs. We just launched a cryptocurrency for our digital company. Like you said, software. What would be your advice for a bunch of vets that are good at kicking in doors that are now getting into this world to, to help fund our nonprofit initiative and our digital company? What would be your advice for us to get noticed when it seems to be like any teenager in their basements creating a project or there's these meme coins? How do you get real estate and uh, attention to the projects that are legit that people are working I on? I mean, Bill Gates started in his basement, right? He did. Uh, was... Also, there are, there are uh, index, uh, DeFi index tokens that capture broad uh, projects that maybe you could look into like dpi you know there's one there's one thing to think about because it's a good question and it involves many people with the same issue i believe there's a direct correlation now 
between social media and market capitalization of companies. And actually, Reddit is part of that. What happened in the last 36 months is that communities like the ones we're in right now, when we're talking to each other, that have a deep understanding of um, you know, what they believe in or what they want to own and what they want to invest in, change market capitalizations. And so, you know, I became a shareholder in, in Robinhood. I'm certainly active on Reddit. I care about what people are thinking about because they're, they're telling me where their money is going. And it also is important for companies to tell their stories so that the successful companies that are able to use social media to tell their stories, explain their mission, talk about what they believe in, what they stand for, end up getting captured into social media redistributed by people that are interested in following them and eventually they turn into investors so the companies that are good at telling their stories online that are good at explaining their missions trade at a higher pe than the ones that are not so people always ask me well, why is amc even trading at all because there's a lot of people that believe there's very there's value inherently locked in there and they've decided to invest in it it's, it's not anybody's one opinion it's it's the overall herd that's making that decision and i think Today, when you talk about, well, how do we get our coins out there? You've really got to be a master of social media. You've got to tell the story, the compelling story that people will then share with others. That's what I believe now in a way that, you know, the tr and I, I live my life with institutions. I explain this to them every day. You guys don't get it yet. The world has changed and the power is now in the hands of millions of people, not a few hundred thousand. That's what's happening. So Can I send you, Kevin, a link to our two-minute video explaining our story and mission? Thank you. Sir how, sir, how do you feel about whenever the CDC starts to regulate all these crypto companies and everybody making false marketing claims about their coins goes underwater? Yeah, I mean, look, there is a lot of nefar you know, nefarious activity. And, and there's also, you know, the idea of meme coins. I mean, Dogecoin, for example, um, just to have some fun with it. I mean, how can you own Dogecoin, Dogecoin and not own Pothereum? I mean, are you basically saying you only support dogs and not cats? There's 100 million cats in America, so you got to own some Pothereum. Now, is that preposterous? Absolutely. But I own Pothereum because I'm a cat lover. But I, I agree, but at the same I time. Cats. I have a company called BasePaws that does cat DNA, so I support cats, not just dogs. And I can tell you in the metaverse, dogs and cats are both going to have wallets. So. If you're buying Dogecoin, you're pissing off 100 million cats. I'd be very careful. I love it. All right. Hey, Kevin, I have a quick question. I just want to let you know I'm a huge fan of Shark Tank, and I think those venture debt deals you do absolutely killing it. But um, my question is, one of the biggest financial burdens amongst other countries is hyperinflation. Do you feel that any specific deflationary coins or tokens could potentially alleviate that issue for some countries? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, the, I'm, look, I'm biased because I'm a huge fan of USDC. But frankly, if I were in Venezuela, I would not take their currency. I'd want to get paid in USDC in a wallet. You could pay me in a MetaMask wallet and I'd be comfortable working for a day's labor and be paid in USDC. I Ultimately, I believe that the, the, the payment systems themselves, the software that allow you to, to do a transaction, bet, you know, uh, bet or put together with the full faith of the U.S. dollar. Now, I, I know people say, oh, the U.S. dollar, you know, it's, we're going to go through inflation because we're printing so much money, but it still is the world's currency. When you buy oil, you buy it in U.S. dollars. When you buy, you know, uh, lot, lots of hard assets in art, for example, you buy it in U.S. dollars. And so it, it's sort of, I, I think the way to solve the, the problems of, of bad government, corrupt government, uh, inept government in these countries where people suffer is to allow them to use something like a stable coin um, and, and you know, provide them the, the, the ease of path so they can do it. And many, many countries, they've done that already. They figured out even though the governments have tried to stop them. And th the thing is, Bitcoin can't do that the same way because the volatility of the price, if you're, if you're someone that's working, making you know, $50 a, a week to support your family, you can't risk a 30% decrease in price of your core asset. That's why a stable coin would work better. And so, you know, I, I took my, I got paid recently for the first time ever on a contract with somebody um, with USDC. I was happy to take it. I'm leaving it in USDC. I've already lent it out. I mean, it's, it's, there, 
there is a way we can solve the world's problems with software, and there's a good use case. Coinbase is pretty quick, though. I, I sold some Bitcoin, switched it over to USDC, and was able to hit an ATM and pull it out real quick. Well, if anybody's listening from Coinbase, here's my beef, okay? Because I, I, I own every platform there is because I'm always testing one against the other. I think Coinbase being first was fantastic. I love Fred. I like the whole team over there. But if you, if you, if you ACH in, you know, $1,000, you can't transfer it out for like, like 10 days. That's too long. That's crazy. That's the biggest problem. Oh, that's why, that's why uh, Coinbase has a debit card. So you're able to actually but switch I, I, and I then pull. I to wait 10 days to transfer <laughs> money that was mine to money that's mine to money that's mine. Like that is one of the reasons that we, we need, we have a lot of work. It's and, instant now, I thought. You know, I'm no, I, I tell the truth. That's, that's what I'm saying. I think, I think it's instant now. Yeah, you can instantly transfer to PayPal now. But now, now there's the the infrastructure bill, and they they pushed a a tax on crypto. Well, I'm talking about a different problem here. I'm just saying, I, I you know I, I, I put if, let's say I want to buy some some coin that's not on Coinbase, but like Pothereum, you can't buy Pothereum on Coinbase, so you have to go out and Uniswap it. And let's say you use MetaMask. MetaMask, you got to. I understand Uniswap. Yeah, but the point in like Pancake. Yeah, but well, you can use others. I get it, but I'm just saying the ACH into Coinbase. Coinbase traps it like a cockroach motel for ten days. You're yeah. Hey, Kevin. <laughs> um, what do you think That's about the, the cockroach the dollar motel? Say that again. What do you think about the dollar becoming an opt-in system? You broke up. Say it one more time. What do you think about the dollar becoming an opt-in system where uh, like people just avoid it yeah, at all costs? I don't, I don't see the regulator going to that one, my friend. That ain't going to happen. I think there's going to be, I think what's going to happen is we're going to see regulation on stable coins first, and then we're going to start to see opening up of major uh, crypto assets like Bitcoin and Ethereum probably next. Um, the, the, the institutional man, which we've been talking about for, for you know, all, all, this afternoon is insatiable. I mean, I can ensure, assure you that after they watch, even though there's volatility, as soon as we've got this thing worked out, I, I, I don't, you're always going to mark to market in most systems, even now, even when you're, you're messing around on, on whatever wallet you're in, you're still marked to market in US dollars. People are still trying to figure out, okay, well, that's X number of ETH, how many dollars, what's the gas involved? I was gonna say, how do you feel about the, that guy that put 8K into, Shiba and now his wallet is 6.5 billion. That's false. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's stories like that, but the truth is just try and make that liquid. That's pretty hard to do. I mean, you know, right, you can't sell it all at once because you you're going to drop all. the price. But meme coins, meme coins are no different than going to Las Vegas and playing on the craps tables. As long as you understand what you're doing, I don't think. Oh, I would never play craps. A long term R roulette or blackjack. Yeah, what, whatever. It's just, but if you if you start to think about, uh, you know, if you if you own Solana or if you own Pythari or Polygon, if you own ETH, these are real, real software platforms that provide measurable productivity. That's different than buying a meme coin, and so we, we have to kind of differentiate the fun versus the, the serious investing. I mean, my so you're telling me Cuban was wrong them. buying Doge? No, look, Doge to me is 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 a meme coin, and I, I you know, I had, it, I, it's definitely a meme coin. But so is Shiba. My point is, if you own Doge, then you're just pissing off every cat in America. That's all. <laughs> uh, Kevin, I'm, I'm, I'm having fun with it. I'm having fun with it. So yeah, I own some Pothereum. It's pre it's preposterous, but I'm I'm supporting the cat community. It's Meanwhile, my cat just jumped on me. <laughs> Kevin, quick question here. Um, what do you think about decentralized blockchain uh, Oracle networks such as Chainlink? Yeah. Um, you know, it's a really, that's a really interesting question because it kind of reminds me of the HBAR debate. You know, when you're talking about Boeing and IBM and these giant behemoths wanting more, they want the decentralized wallet but they want centralized control. And so 
they're, they're concerned from a compliance basis that when they develop these new platforms, how do they get the most of the best of both worlds? Some kind of centralized control with the benefits of decentralization. And that in itself is a great debate, a really, really great debate, because I think ultimately that's what is going to be the most interesting solution. Because when you talk about, you know, talking to a giant corporation about putting all of their data on, in a decentralized world, they, they just, they, they, don't, they don't feel right about it. They're just not comfortable. Yeah. Well, what right. do you think about so what's, what's, your, what's your take on uh, GameStop having an NFT? I think there's nothing wrong with them doing that. I mean, look, they, they're trying to think outside the box. I know that, um, you know, I am going to pay someone to turn my entire watch collection into NFTs so that I can uh, deal with the insurance company. And one of the problems I've got, you know, I'm in New York today. I'm traveling with six pieces. Um, I've got many, 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 many more, but the insurance company needs to know where my six pieces are. And so, you know, and, and so I, if I had- Is that like head, travel insurance though? No, not, not for these pieces, my friend. You're not gonna get that. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not balling like you. Oh, no, it, it's, sort, it's sort of, think of the solution I could have if I had everything on the chain, everything in a smart contract, and I could let, I could let everybody know where each piece is every day. That I, my insurance costs would go down by fifty percent. I don't need to insure the ones that are in bank vaults in Geneva. I need to insure the ones that are sitting with me in a city. So I only want to insure the ones that are active. These are real use cases, and that's why NFTs are going to be. I think the NFT market is going to be bigger than Bitcoin one day. Kevin, follow up question regarding um, Chainlink. Uh, have you heard about them and their recent integration uh, with the Associated Press and how they're beginning to use uh, decentralized blockchain oracle networks? Yeah, I have. I, that's that's a well documented situation. It's very encouraging to see an institution like that adopted. I mean, that's that's just more good news. That uh, let me tell you something. That piece of news helps us get the regulator on board. They start to realize there's real use cases. In, in really large institutional clients, this is good for crypto. What happens uh, whenever businesses start using crypto though as payment? Well, they're gonna start with the stable coins first. That's what's gonna happen. And, and as soon as stable coins get regulated, I, I, keep, I keep going back to it. The number one big move that we could get today would just simply say, okay, to all, I don't care if you're Tether, I don't care if you're USDC, I don't care what stable coin we're talking about. They're all the same rules. You have to abide by these rules. And now we're okay with you using it as a payment system. You're going to see car companies, watch companies. You're going to see Walmart. You're going to see everybody. Everybody's going to say, okay, great. Let's, if you want to pay in USDC, pay in USDC or pay in Tether, whatever the hell it is that you want to pay with. But it's going to start with a stable coin because it's not, it doesn't have the volatility. I think what the regulators concerned about is if you're, if you're processing a payment, you don't want the price to go down 30 or up 30 percent in five hours like that's a huge problem so i, I see the opportunity bigger in stable coins first hey kevin uh, i have a follow-up question so what you were saying that a lot of these more speculative assets are more like gambling in a casino so i wanted to know do you think there's any future in the speculative market that is uh tokenomics and certain coins that you see now well, let me answer it with another question. Do you really think there's room for 10,000 coins in five years? I mean, it, can you keep enough interest in 10,000 coins? Or is, th is there going to be a consolidation around market cap? I mean, I think all of us should think about that. You're building a portfolio. I, I get the joke on mean coins. When you start to think about where you're putting real dough to work, you have to start thinking about a more consolidated situation. I, 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 I can't, I really can't see 50 more coins a day coming to the market. I really can't. I mean, it's like, it's like saying there'll be 50 more currencies. Um, we're in an early stage here, but I'm, I'm more in the boat where there's going to be certain things that become standards and they get the majority of, they get the, the lion's share of the capital in them and then other stuff will be fringe forever. But, but that's, that's not, you know, that's different than NFTs. 
NFTs have tremendous potential. You know, when you buy a car, I would rather have my contract in an NFT than a document you sent me. I'd rather have that on the chain forever. I want all the service information on that. I want every single part ever exchanged in it on the chain. All of this stuff. Hey, Kevin, there's a question from. He's not here. Give him a second. Yeah, let's let me add him back and hold on. Great conversation, everybody. Hey, um, Kevin, are you still there? Hey, Kevin is back. Okay. Well, we literally have a shark on the stage. <laughs> hey, Kevin, you seem to be muted. That New York Wi Fi. Um, let's see if we can get him back in here. Sorry for the sorry for trouble. Just to uh, keep the conversation going, you know, one thing we do as a small business is we actually uh, give a discount for customers to pay in crypto. Pretty interesting. So there's a cash discount and a premium charge for credit card processing. But for anyone paying in crypto, we uh, actually give a discount. Pretty interesting to, uh, you know, show adoption and get it going for everyone. Yeah, that's definitely a great way to, you know, boost adoption so that people would be incentivized to play, make the payments via crypto. Yeah. As a small business, I don't mind getting not a stable coin, like O'Leary said. I don't mind getting a volatile coin. Being a business owner, the risk is worth it long term, you know, for, for adoption. And for customers to get an email blast, you know, if I email 40,000 customers and they all of a sudden see these crypto symbols in their email, and they go, oh, wow, it's adoption. It's really happening. So that's a big thing. We have to uh, do that and uh, bring everyone on board, you know, for people who are still scared or the older generation as well. How would you deal with taxes on these incomes when people pay with cryptos? You need accounting for that, right? You do need proper accounting for it, but uh, that's a gray area. You know, if you send it to a cold storage wallet, then uh, that's one way to do it. But you're supposed to do your own taxes, right? If you collect cash in this cashless system, you're supposed to report it or you can expense it. So, yes, you should pay your taxes with the crypto and you're supposed to for business inquiry, business intake for crypto. But, you know, that's uh, we're still unregulated and we're still trying to figure that out. But if it goes time, it's, it's negotiable. That's why you use uh, XMR uh, for payments. Can you elaborate? XMR is a privacy coin. Um, it's on but you still have to pay your taxes eventually if you are oh yeah yeah of course of it's, course it, it's just advisable to just pay your taxes and be on the good side of the business yeah well if and you can like sell what, tax for your, your state you know and if but i may that add what that. Kevin was saying that institutional to see more institutional adoption we should definitely have a lot of compliance built into crypto systems built into exchanges so it would be easier to bis for businesses to start adopting crypto as a payment currency. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And if I may add, uh, as this this is I don't live in US, so that's what I have been seeing uh, happening. 
is that the tax regulations within U.S. is a little bit um, more complicated for like the normal people who are not involved in these sort of communities. Um, so maybe that's something that by just making some adjustments uh, that you can bring in more people because a lot of people are scared that, okay, yeah, I don't know how to handle the crypto tax. and I, I don't know what happens there. Then so they will just stay away from it. Uh, so I think that's also a part that should be improved, but I don't know how you guys are going to how you guys are going to deal with that one. Yeah, honestly, um, getting rid of crypto capital gains tax would, I think, cause people to flood into it uh, and use it on a daily basis. Uh, yeah, totally. But I don't think you need to completely get rid of the tax. Um, um, I, I don't want to like... Oh, it's just capital it's gains like, tax. You can yeah, still get charged income, tax. but... Yeah, so like after a certain amount of portfolio that you have, uh, they just assume in some countries, at least European ones, they just assume a fixed rate. So no matter what you do, uh, that kind of pushes you toward investments because, you know, OK, I'm going to pay this much fixed tax regardless of what I do. I can keep it in a bank or I can invest it and actually earn something on top of it. So I'm going to just invest my money and hopefully I'll get something out of it. And then the tax would not be an issue because um, I would have made more out of it. Um, so, yeah, that, that's actually like a good um, approach that they do. Um, um, if you're in the U.S., you can, what you can do is you can look into a charitable remainder trust. So that's one way to avoid paying capital gains, actually. So I'm going to be looking into that myself. But it's, it's I mean, it, it, it's a good way to avoid paying your taxes. So, yeah. Wait, what's it called? What type of trust is charitable that? remainder charitable remainder trust crt so what you do trust. yeah so what you do you go to your lawyer or or um your accountant and you ask them to set up a crt for you and then you create a wallet you know that you can deposit um your crypto earnings and that way you don't get taxed so it's a you have to set it up with your lawyer or your accountant yeah this is, and again, this, this is for, for people in the U.S., by the way. I don't know about other countries. Oh, that was quite clear, but I still think that this is a little bit too too much for, um, like, the guy who is um, barely capable of holding his phone or, like, using a smartphone. Um, but they, they might have quite a lot of money, but they will never, like, invest in crypto because, well, this would scare them away. Um, maybe so maybe crypto lawyers will become in high demand. <laughs> uh, definitely. I'd love to talk about optics, if um, if I may. Please yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I think we have a giant optics problem in crypto, and I think it's uh, it's going to be a problem, and it's going to hurt adoption. We do, but there are also people working actively to come up with solutions. So I think we have a good chance of solving these optic problems given time. I say three years, five years, we definitely have a shot at you know improving the optics. Right now, it all stems from largely it stems from misunderstanding some of the crucial aspects of crypto and crypto investments. And I think over time, we'll definitely have a more level playing field, given that more people would start understanding the basics of crypto, especially with incoming regulatory clarity, we will improve in this field. Well, how about the fact that we're kind of heading for a climate disaster and and to kind of deny that is, is, is becoming harder and harder. So people are gonna scapegoat proof of work or specifically, they're just going to scapegoat cryptocurrency. And it's going to cause a lot of people not to want to adopt because they're they're thinking that it's causing climate change, which it clearly isn't causing climate change. It may be contributing. But there's a lot of people that are going to scapegoat crypto as being nefarious, illegal. Oh, that, that's already been happening. Uh, I mean, have you saw recently the thing that happened with Discord about them? They were thinking of potentially integrating some crypto related or NFT related integrations onto their platform. Um, and a lot of people were complaining on Twitter saying, 
wow, NFTs are ruining the environment, crypto is ruining the environment. Uh, and because of that, they decided to say, oh, this was just for uh, internal testing and kind of a concept uh, as opposed to, you know, them potentially actually integrating that. So we're already kind of, you know, seeing, you know, crypto act as a scapegoat, you know, for people saying, oh, it's causing, you know, uh, or it's, it's adding to the climate crisis and whatnot. So it, it yeah, doesn't, I no, think that, uh, that's one company. Sure, go ahead. It just, oh, it okay. Help. Uh, I think that, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, people use the climate uh, scapegoat because they're too scared to learn about something that's new. So they're just like, oh, let's just jump to the next, uh, you know, reason to not adopt it. And then they'll look and, you know, hear people complaining about proof of work using electricity and it's bad for the climate, whatever. Yeah, exactly. First, uh, they were all saying, oh, it's, you know, used for criminals and whatnot. And now they're going with the idea of, oh, it's uh, bad for the climate, it's bad for the environment. I mean, there's a, a lot of, come on. Yeah, I mean, I mean there, there's a lot of bad for the environment. This is yeah, but look, look, there's, there's, there's a lot of companies that are uh, actually having, uh, you know, they, they're carbon neutral. Um, a lot of, you know, uh, that are, you know, working on the blockchain, like, for example, one of them being the, the wax platform for NFTs, they're actually carbon neutral. And I mean, over time, uh, a lot of companies, you know, are going to both companies and, you know, a lot of these cryptos are going to start being uh carbon neutral so it's it's just a matter of time but i'm, I mean, I'm pretty sure are. kevin o'leary has a climate or a carbon neutral mining facility for ethereum in canada there's actually a carbon neutral bitcoin mining facility in new york and if you look at the news articles which said all oh, this company is you know polluting making I mean, the it's not Seneca. Part. It's not Seneca. Yeah, the Seneca, Seneca Lake. Yeah, the Seneca Lake. No, it is not. It is absolutely not. That is that is incorrect information. The company is Greenage Generation, and they are definitely they are carbon not carbon neutral. neutral. They are not I mean, carbon neutral. You're acting like normal companies don't, uh, you know, usually. I mean, a lot of companies are carbon negative, you know, or positive when it comes to, you know, how they run their business. So. Um, if I may add, that was actually a question that I wanted to ask Kevin. He he went through the ethical mining and so on. Um, um, I'm actually in a field that we are pushing towards sustainability, and that's what I'm working on. Um, and I wanted to make it clear that when a company says they are carbon neutral, it doesn't mean that they don't have any pollutions. It means that they do some other efforts um, that would offset what they do. Um, so that's 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 what you should consider. Uh, but also, um, people tend to freak out. Like, also, we have the issue with the aviation, and everybody says that, oh, no, we shouldn't use planes. But if you look at the numbers, um, the amount of emissions that you would get from the aviation is nothing compared to the amount of emissions that you would have from power generations. Um, if you want to look at the data, just hit me up, and I'll send you the links for all of these. These are all publicly available. Um, but when it comes to cryptocurrency, um, because it's decentralized and we don't know where it's being mined um, for the majority of it, um, we cannot really put a figure of, um, well, how much damage are we actually doing to the environment? Is it doing a damage? Yes, definitely. Uh, can we improve it? Absolutely. But for the time being, I think switching to uh, proof of stake, at least using um, um, normal stuff, like if you want to accept uh, crypto as a sort of payment, uh, go with the funds that are proof of stake. So uh, that at least helps a little bit. Uh, but in the long run, yeah, we need to find the better ways to actually deal with everything we do in the day, not just uh, cryptocurrency. Absolutely. Modern, robust nuclear power. We have to start rolling it out. If we had that, if we had modern, robust nuclear power rolled out across America, I would say mind to your heart is content. Problem is the price tag. Um, yeah, but like I, I don't want to go into too much like uh, out of the crypto zone. Um, but the argument against nuclear power is um, a moral, um, a moral conversation. It's it's not related to the technology. Let's 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 be clear. It's by far the cleanest thing we can do. 
um, but it has its own issues, um, as you can, as you already know. Um, but ultimately, at least in my opinion, is that we need to find ways to make everything we do circular. So we don't need to remove plastics from our life because if we do, we're gonna be in a shed show. Or we need to go back to the caves. Um, but what we need to do is to remove like single uses. We need to recycle everything back to what it was. As this is what is called a circular economy. Um, um, but like with the crypto, well, uh, I don't know how you would implement that. Um, but yeah, we have to wait and see uh, what the future holds. But if we're in a place where we are in an absolute climate catastrophe, uh, I'm trying to go back to the optics here. Are people really going to want to adopt when they have no idea? How are we going to educate people? How are we going to get this bro culture, this libertarian, I don't want to pay taxes, so I'm going to use Monero and privacy coins, and I'm not going to be contributed, contributing to society. How do we kind of minimize that? How do we get it mainstream? And that's where I see the big hurdle is getting people like um, my younger sister to be interested in this, right? Because she thinks that all cryptocurrency is bad for the environment. That's not true. Well, everything is in principle, even the phone that you use every day, it is damaging the environment. Um, so if you want to be real, everything we do, like that's the nature of the universe. If you, if you know anything about thermodynamics is that the only way we can go is toward disaster. We can only slow it down to a degree, but that's how the nature works. We cannot really do anything about it. Um, but um, yeah. Um, Hey, I'll butt in here and and uh, comment on the avoiding taxes uh, argument. Like, I do pay my taxes, and I hate it. But I would not hate it if my tax money was actually spent to do good things, right? Exactly. So there's a difference between, like, robbery and charity. It, it's two very different concepts. Yeah, so once people start to see that actually is improving their neighborhood, their livelihood, they would be actually quite glad to pay their taxes. Unless, well, they are, they are a-holes. Pay your taxes, everyone. Uh, I suspect uh, Kevin is not coming back. Yeah, I think Kevin is gone. Even we tried texting him, and I think he had the problem. Wow, he goes to this. His Wi-Fi network, and then after that, he probably just had other issues with his app. It wouldn't be Reddit without technical difficulties. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> So do you guys think Bitcoin's hitting 100K by the end of the year? I definitely doubt it at this point, but it's Bitcoin, so you can't say no. <laughs> yeah, don't short Bitcoin. Yeah, I don't think that's worked out in the long run. So even though at this point, 100K looks mm, impossible, but in you know November of 2017, 20k looked almost impossible. Nobody would have said Bitcoin would have 20k in November so of 2017. So that's always something you should consider with Bitcoin. If it goes up, you just need like a couple of good news and it's just moved on to the next level. Yeah, but I, I feel like um, I feel like those larger market cap coins, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, you know, they'll definitely go up pretty good amount uh but i don't think we're gonna get back to you know that volatility that we had back in like 2017 um just because of the amount of you know institutions that have finally begun to invest in crypto it seems like crypto is kind of uh stabilizing at least for the larger market cap coins they're kind of stabilizing you know you're not gonna have a coin that goes to like uh 
five dollars that's like a high market you know aside from you know shiba but i feel like the crypto space has definitely changed um over like the past four years i agree I, yeah i agree yeah and i think we owe that actually meme coins as much as i hate them um i think they've brought kind of a publicity to all of the crypto market and that has led us to a point that i think everybody now knows what they are um yeah, they're 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 meme coins, but well, they've they've given us uh, marketing. Yeah, some similar to the dot com bubble, you know, where we have all these stupid sites like pets dot com and whatnot that have you know no revenue but insane valuations, um, and you know it brings people over, but you know eventually the actual good companies and actually you know stay and develop over time, and that's how we have you know have now Amazon, one of the largest companies uh, on earth yeah exactly i think uh someone mentioned it previously but um i think one of our biggest hurdles right now is just getting adoption for cryptocurrency and i think uh what we need to do just as regular citizens is just like let people know about cryptocurrency educate people about the benefits of it and everything um and yeah i was actually gonna ask kevin like what us regular citizens can do uh, to help move along the adoption adoption of cryptocurrency and nfts but i think that's one of the biggest things we can all do right now just educate um yeah that's true but honestly i will never really in my real life tell people like this is what i do this is my portfolio this is what you should look into. It, it's when it comes to financial advice and like telling people about the crypto. Um, if any of you have any suggestions on how to introduce to other people, um, I'm more than glad to hear it. Um, but personally, I just stay out of it. Yeah, so there's, there's both sides. So now, especially since Bitcoin is now an ETF, you can slowly start introducing people to it. Like my friends know I'm into crypto. My family also knows. So with regulatory clarity there's definitely something that will improve over time back in 2015 2016 people are just nobody knows like people in crypto oh i don't know anyone in crypto so now it's just moving like you're hearing politicians talk about crypto hearing cities adopt their own coins hearing countries like el salvador adopting crypto it's all over in the news so there's definitely something that's improving from an optics perspective from also from a you know like a personal discussion perspective you can talk with a lot more lot more people about crypto right now yeah, yeah definitely sorry secretly definitely don't be stupid about it like don't uh don't reveal like all your holdings and stuff we don't allow people to that to do that in daily discussion but it does help if you're able to normalize it a little bit by just making it common for a friend to know and someone that people can ask questions about cryptocurrencies like I've gotten over the years thousands of people asking me the same questions like, what do I buy? What do I do? And then they get old after a while. But it's good that you're at least a human face for people to talk to, I would say. And to that end, um, you know, we do have cryptocurrency merch. I just have to mention that real quick. So you can just wear a crypto shirt around or have a crypto uh, coffee mug or something. And maybe that'll help normalize it a little bit. It's a good talking point, at least. Yeah, no. And, and what, what I meant is like, um i might have come across like i don't know not the way i want to but i i, I want to make clear that like cryptocurrency just in general is really really good it has a lot of benefits like kevin was saying like it can help move money faster and it's, it's not as like um, costly um and i think we have this whole notion that like cryptocurrency is this get rich quick scheme and people treat it like that and it has all these benefits that um that people are ignoring like i, I don't think people Think of that first, and I think of cryptocurrency. And I, I think, think we Satoshi should address that. It best. Satoshi uh, Nakamoto, he said, you know, if you don't understand it, then I don't have the time to explain it to you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I, I think like we need to, uh, at least for me, the, the best part about it is the decentralization. Um, and not about just the financial aspects of it, as uh, Kevin was saying, like about his watches. Now that's just one thing. Uh, if if we look at the look, okay, if we just start to store um, 
I don't know, scientific facts. It's something that we want to keep actually, not um, a stupid photo of, um, now I want to like name an animal that wouldn't offend people, but yeah, you know. Uh, I think if we start to use um, in a more uh, productive way the crypto and not just like promote uh, shit coins here and shit tokens here and there, I think that would be um, a slower growth, but it would be the one that would actually stick. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I think NFT ticketing might uh, might help with that area, especially um, with like club passes and stuff. Uh, people would like to collect them. I think that would bring a lot of like music and arts and festival goers into crypto, which I already know that those communities overlap, but yeah, it'll absolutely. just help. I think that's, that's a good start. And then maybe, maybe just legal contracts. I think that would be a huge hit if, if that starts to happen. Well, it sucks that Kevin had to leave because my question was for him. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, just got disconnected and then we couldn't get him back in. He was having some issues with his connectivity, so. Yeah, I, just, I just wanted to know if he, like, since he was looking at the layer two solutions, if he ever mm -hmm. wondered looking at something like Luxo for his watch collection for NFTs once they launch. I think that would have been a good option. So the point of NFTs is, like, a lot of them are on Ethereum because Ethereum is one of the oldest chains, so that's that's why most of these NFTs, if you look at CryptoPunks or these BAYCs, all of them are Ethereum because Ethereum is just the oldest chain that just attracts value. That's how I see it right now. Slowly Solana is getting there. There's some expensive NFTs there. But L2's NFTs, they really need to start because even OpenSea doesn't support either Arbitrum or Optimism as well as I know. So. It's supposed Polygon, so there's some NFTs there, but there's not a big culture in Polygon NFTs. There's a big culture in Solana is just starting. Of course, Ethereum leads the way. So that's why we have almost all the NFTs on Ethereum right now and not on L2s. But definitely L2s, especially for ticketing and all these actual, you know, infrastructure-wise ticketing and uh, watch collection, definitely companies can explore NFTs on L2 because you don't need a history, you don't need a chain with history, you just, you just need software that works. So that's definitely possible. Yeah. I mean, I think digital profiles will help, which is something they're doing. Yeah, so dif digital profiles definitely. So I think ENS is also part of moving on to L2 slowly, probably in the next six months. And once that happens, I think we can see more adoption in that aspect in that domain. Uh, well, I would like to thank everyone. Uh, I really enjoyed the discussion, but I have to leave. Thank you so much for joining. I think we'll just wind this up. We'll definitely yeah. have more talks for everyone soon. And thanks everyone for joining. Thanks to yeah, Kevin as you. well. Yeah, thanks for hosting. Thank, thank, thank you guys. <laughs> Did he mention if he will, um, if there'll be another time where he'll speak on here? Uh, so we actually got in for this slot because the earliest slot we had last week, we couldn't make that work. But again, unfortunately, he had some network issues. We'll try to get him on for another slot. Otherwise, we'll just we'll just get on somebody else. We're definitely working on more talks and should hear from us soon. Nice. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you yeah, so thanks much. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all.